Alright, welcome to chapter 4. Except, not really. First, we get introduced to the brand new Battle Preparations menu. This will appear at the beginning of each chapter from now on, allowing us to see the map and plan out the beginning of each chapter more easily than before. This episode of the series will be entirely devoted to explaining the options on this menu, so if you're not interested in that, feel free to just skip to the next video where I play the actual chapter 4. But for the rest of you, let's get right into it. Starting from the top, we now can no longer bring every unit in our army to each battle. Each chapter from now on will have a maximum limit. Sire, another battle is imminent. You will have to choose which of our units will accompany you. Um, all of them. No, sire. Why not? No, sire. Why not? So Marth is mandatory, but he does count toward the total, so in this chapter we really have the option of 13 to work with. I'll be dropping the extraneous Axemen that I don't want to use, oh, Barst, definitely want to use Barst, and bring the three new recruits from last chapter instead. View map lets you see the situation on the map before it officially begins, including checking enemy stats and inventories. Uh, it can really help inform who you bring to each chapter and how you outfit them. You can also swap the starting positions of anybody in the army, except for Marth. So it's good for getting people in the positions that you need them on that crucial first turn. Inventory lets you manage the items each character is holding, including trading between people. Storing and retrieving items from the convoy. and merging damaged weapons together to combine their uses and extend their lifespan a little longer. We've got Mart's damaged iron sword, 13 of 40 uses. We got this iron sword with only two uses, merge them together, and now we've got one sword with 15 uses. The list function is pretty handy for finding every copy of a specific item in the entire army without needing to hunt through everyone's inventory individually. So you can see that this is the iron sword Jagan has, the one Kane has, the one Agma has. So it's just, I mean, an entire list of all the weapons, regardless of who's carrying them or whether they're in the convoy. Unload lets you dump a character's entire inventory into the convoy if you're not planning on using them. So, reclass. Reclass is a feature that lets you change characters' classes to another. There are a few restrictions on it, though. The first is on the right, with these maximum limits for each class that are showing in green. Uh, the maximum is how many characters of that class we could theoretically have at this point in the game, plus one. For example, in the very top right, the axe icon represents fighters and their promoted class. Board, Cord, and Barst are the three possible recruitable fighters at this point in the game, so the maximum is four, one more than three. I can change, say, Drog to a fighter to hit that maximum, and then I can't change anyone else into it. Unless I went to one of the fighters I'm not using anyway, like Board, and changed them to something else. And then I can change Ogma into a fighter, because I've freed up that, uh, freed up that slot. Uh, even if a character dies or you miss out on recruiting one, they still count towards the total. So even though we didn't get Norn because of I wasn't willing to uh, trying to find Drog, I can't find him without him being a knight. Uh, even though we missed out on Norn, you can see uh, here in the archer section that our maximum is still three because technically we could have had Norn, we could have had two archers, and then one additional one over those two archers would be three. The second restriction is that not just anyone can be any class. For men, there are two different class sets, Set A and Set B. If you start in a class in one set, you can only reclass to classes within that same set. So a Cavalier, like Abel, is a Set 1 class, which also includes Archer, Myrmidon, Mage, and Curate. Set B includes Knight, Mercenary, Fighter, Hunter, Pirate, and Dark Mage. Women have a simpler process, but one that's more restricted, because there is only one set for them, because there are only five base classes they're allowed to use. Pegasus Knight, Archer, Myrmidon, Mage, and Cleric. And only one of them wears pants. Thanks, Japan. One exception to the reclass rules comes when women or men in a set A class promote. Women can't be Cavaliers, as you can see, but when they promote, they have the option to reclass into Paladin, the promoted class for Cavaliers. Men can't be Pegasus Knights, but men in the promoted A set class can reclass to Draco Knight, the normal promotion for Pegasus Knights. 
The third restriction on reclass is that changing classes adjust your stats. Characters have stats unique to them in this game, but their actual stat totals are the personal stats for the character combined with the base stats of their class, which are universal to everyone who is a member of that class. For example, the reason Jagan has 10 skill is because all paladins get 5. Jagan as a character actually just has a base skill of 5, and his 10 total comes from his personal 5 skill plus the 5 skill provided by paladin. If I reclass him to Sniper, the promoted form of Archer, which gives 8 skill, his stat is raised by 3 to match. If Jagan leveled up his skill by 1 point uh, up until now, he'd have 11 skill as a Paladin, and 14 skill as a Sniper, the base from his class, plus his base personals, plus the 1 point he personally gained. Reclassing never permanently increases or decreases your stats, it only readjusts based on your class bases, and switching back will just give you the stats that you would have had otherwise. Weapon ranks work similarly. In unpromoted classes, reclassing starts you off with an undeveloped E rank in any new weapon types, but reclassing to a class that uses the same weapon type allows you to keep your progress in raising that weapon rank. If Abel reclasses to Archer, he needs to start at the bottom with Iron Bows and train his skill up from E rank. If I reclass him to Myrmidon, though, he gets to keep his D rank in Swords and even the progress he's made towards C rank. Promoted classes are more merciful. Classes that specialize in certain weapons will give a massive boost to your weapon rank when you reclass into them, even if you've never touched that weapon before. Sniper gives instant C rank with bows. Same with Swordmaster for swords. Sage and Bishop give D rank in tomes and staves to start with, and so on and so forth. And finally, for the last restriction, special classes like Lord, Thief, and a few others can't reclass at all, and nobody can reclass into them. Overall, I think the reclass system is a pretty cool way to add another layer of tactical depth and replayability into the game. With the unrestricted access that Shadow Dragon allows you to take between chapters, you can do things like uh, change Barst into a pirate so he can walk on water while lowering just a couple of his stats. After we promote Sita, we can change her into a paladin to keep her using her good lance rank and trade off her flyer mobility to remove her weakness to bows. You can make Jagan a Draco Knight and have a second flying unit, which is awesome. And you can completely change or optimize the course of a character's career, like uh, remove jo Drog from the Knight class and make him a Mercenary or a Dark Mage, and suddenly he's one of the fastest units in our army and he can actually take advantage of his good speed growth. The possibilities, the possibilities are really endless, especially when you consider that changing classes also adjusts your growth rates. Just like base stats, the growth rates I've been showing on the screen so far when I introduce each character are a combination of a character's personal growths and their individual class growths, uh, adjusting those. For this playthrough, I'm going to be using it only sparingly. First, because I'm trying to do a fairly vanilla playthrough where I don't mess with bases too much. And secondly, because I think each character's persona in these games is sort of defined by the class they start in. Sita not being a Pegasus Knight or Drog not being in heavy armor just feels kind of unnatural to me. And there's nothing in the games to suggest that anyone's in Marth's army canonically changed up their career paths in the middle of the war, so I'm sticking to base classes with maybe a couple of exceptions for gameplay purposes later. The armory lets you uh, sell, and sell items from anyone's inventory, and buy basic E-rank weapons and staves. Oh, that's the forge. It's good if you're running low on basic gear, or if you reclassed somebody and need an extra weapon for them to use. For stronger or specialized equipment though, you need to take the initiative of buying it at the armories within each chapter, because they'll never show up here. The stock that's in here now is what it's going to be for the rest of the game. The forge in the armory though is awesome, it's where most of your money will go in this game. You can take almost any weapon and improve its power, accuracy, base critical hit chance, and you can even reduce its weight so that it slows down uh, weak characters less. Uh, one good use for it is to take an E-rank weapon like the Iron Sword and pump its stats up so that the character using it can still keep up with damage despite not being able to use stronger weapons. Training wheels almost until their stats and weapon ranks let them stand on their own. You can use that to get around the fact that reclassing an unpromoted class makes them start at E-rank because you can still give them uh, what's essentially a much stronger weapon even though they can still use it at E-rank. You can also start with a strong weapon like, uh, like Jagan's Silver Lance and pump it up to even more extreme levels, give it to your best unit, and just watch them shred through the whole game. Stronger weapons are more expensive to improve, though. A couple things to watch out for. 
You can only forge one weapon between each chapter. You can't forge a weapon that's already been forged before. And once a weapon has been forged, it can't be repaired by merging it with a normal weapon, even the same one that it was originally made from. So it's much more difficult to keep it repaired. It's explicitly a temporary support. Forging weapons that are effective against specific weapon unit types is arguably the most effective use of the forge. For example, when Sita's wing spear is used against armored or horse-mounted enemies, its 8 might is tripled to 24 before being added to her strength in the damage calculation. Bumping up the might just a couple of times to 10 means it's now getting raised to 30 when used against its specific targets. So each point of might we forge into the weapon effectively increases its might by 3 when we're using it against the right enemies. When pushed to the logical extreme, you can see how this makes the weapon and its user some of the deadliest in the game. But there's no need for a weapon that strong at this point in the game, and I don't like to forge with a damaged weapon anyway. We'll save our gold for this chapter. Weirdly enough, you can, uh, you can actually decrease uh, weapon stats. Uh, it still costs money. I think it's less. I'm not really sure. Uh, this is really bizarre to me. First of all, why would you ever want to decrease a weapon stats? And second of all, why does it cost you more to do that when you're making the weapon less effective? I would think at the very least, if you wanted to like pump up the might here, and then you decrease the accuracy, you'd think that'd give you a discount on the improvements that you made to it. So I don't know. And finally, we can access the options menu as normal and save our preparations before going into the next battle. I'm going to prepare my army off camera, and I'll see you in the next episode when we take on the actual chapter. See you then.